Hi, I'm Amanda Carlson, Associate Editor of Practical Welding Today. We cover the welding industry in our magazines, and now I want to take that same practical approach by providing you with a series of webisodes covering welding technology, processes, and safety. Speaking of safety, when it comes to welding, there's no better place to start, whether you're an experienced welder or a beginner. I'm here with Mike Merriman and Larry Clevenger, and we're here at Rock Valley College. Uh, these gentlemen are welding instructors here, and every semester they have to start new with new students when it comes to welding safety, what to wear, what to do. So these guys have a pretty good idea of, of what to do, what not to do, and, and actually how to teach these new people that. So if I could ask you guys, what is it that you like to stress to your new classes? Uh, when they first come to class, the new students especially, is general clothing. Uh, we have students show up in all types of clothing, wouldn't you agree, Larry? Yes. Uh, we, especially if it's in the summertime, uh, they may show up in shorts, sandals, t-shirts, and they don't realize the hazards that go along with that. Mm -hmm. the, the type of uh, shirt you wear, the type of pants, boots, uh, the clothing needs to be uh, made of either cotton or wool, mm -hmm. something non-flammable. Uh, the old polyesters and rayons and things like that are a big no-no. We have run into issues with uh, the younger uh, generation wearing types of, especially the pants. Uh, they wear blue jeans, which is great, but they wear blue jeans with those great big holes in them and big frayed uh, spots all, all over the jeans, mm -hmm. and that's a big fire hazard. Specifically with frayed jeans, what are some of the hazards that are involved with that? When they're welding with a stick welding, you have uh, slag, and slag is hot, and it will start a piece of frayed material, and it does not flame up, it wicks up into their blue jeans, and will catch, it'll keep going and going and going in as it burns the pant leg up, and it will then, it stinks to high heaven, and so then you can go ahead and uh, tell that somebody's on fire. One of the gentlemen that we had, we even had to tape his pant leg up to keep it from catching on fire for the rest of the class. <laughs> I had one gentleman have a brand new pair of coveralls and when he put them on they're too long the pant legs are and when he was during the day when he was welding slag got in there and set the pant leg on fire and it doesn't flame up it's wicks up and uh, next thing you know well you can smell the smell and then he's all uh, we ended up cutting the pant legs off. Now for sleeves, for long sleeve shirts, obviously I've, I've seen on TV some, you know, these TV welders are wearing short sleeve shirts. What, what's wrong with that? What um, can happen? What's wrong with it is that uh, when you produce an arc, the arc uh, gives off uh, rays, uh, ultraviolet rays, and that rays is stronger than the sun, and it will burn your skin. So we have all of our students wear uh, either long sleeve shirts or a proper welding jacket. In the summertime, no, they're not gonna wear a long sleeve shirt. But we have wel uh, welding jackets that cover their skin. So 100% of your skin has to be covered. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's exposed to those ultraviolet rays, which will get burned. Uh, and that includes, uh, you know, buttoning the top button on your shirt or the welding jacket, whichever, whichever the case may be, and because that your skin mm -hmm. is very tender. Obviously, you need to wear a welding helmet. That's absolutely one of the most important pieces of safety equipment that you can have. What about safety glasses, particularly under, underneath your welding helmet? I think some people may believe that that's not necessary. The welding helmet will provide them with enough protection. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we go ahead and with their stick welding, we make it mandatory to wear safety glasses underneath there because when they raise their helmet up to chip the slag off, their eyes are exposed, and if they don't remember to put the safety glasses on, they're going to chip away the slag, and then they're going to have a chance of getting hit in the eye. Uh, back to the safety glasses, we also require not only that the glasses be safe, the safety type, but also that they have side shields that wrap around. These are prescription safety glasses with a side shield. Okay. And this is what we're making mandatory now to for anybody that wears regular eyeglasses mm -hmm. is to have to have a safety shield on the side to protect the side of the eye. And also safety frames. Okay, and where can you get a safety shield? These here come just a, with the regular safety glasses. Okay. These are regular lenses, safety glass lenses, and they come with the side shields. Okay. 
We talked about helmets a little bit. We talked about glasses. We talked about long sleeves. We talked about proper denim. What about the shoes? Now I've got a regular pair of tennis shoes on today. Uh, they're canvas. They got a little leather in them. What is that okay? And if not, what are some of the some of the things I'm exposing myself to by wearing these kinds of shoes? Well, in our program, we don't allow uh, anybody to wear tennis shoes or sneakers in the lab. They're flammable, plus they don't uh, protect your feet enough. We, uh, when we're welding, we're welding metals, and those metals sometimes can be kind of heavy. Uh, for instance, here's a piece that is actually one of the smaller pieces that we do. If you were to drop that on your toe and you had tennis shoes on, it wouldn't protect you very well. <laughs> no. Another issue, too, is the, the height of your shoe or boot. We require work boots with high tops that will tuck up under your pant leg. Mm -hmm. That way, when sparks are produced, they'll follow down your pant leg and fall onto the floor rather than down inside your shoe. I've seen that happen on a couple of occasions. I have a pair of tennis shoes on right now, and I have shown a person how to, well, you know, tip the slag well. off, and it went right down and right between your toes, and there's no way you're gonna get it out before it puts burn. <laughs> that you probably broke a record for taking off your shoe. No, there's no sense of even taking no. it off. You just have to grin and bear it okay. and say, oh, it's hot. <laughs> We're also gonna show you just a brief demonstration of how to make sure that your welding environment is safe. Uh, obviously, we have got a lot of variables in there. We've got gas cylinders, welding rods, you've got cords from your welding guns. We just wanna make sure that you know how to set up your environment safely so you don't run into any problems that could be avoided. We're here in the shop and we're going to go over a few things regarding welding helmets. Uh, we have right here a standard welding helmet and then we've got an auto darkening helmet. Um, which do you guys prefer to use with your classes and maybe you can talk about some of the advantages of a standard and some of the advantages of an auto darkening helmet. Personally I will use either. I think it's easier for using the auto darkening. Uh, it, it's clear as soon as you strike the arc it automatically uh, goes to the darkness mm -hmm. that, that you need for that type of welding. The standard, you have to uh, learn a skill, and that's called tipping the helmet. And I personally, I stress the beginning students to get this type of helmet. First of all, it's less expensive, but as a welder, they need to learn, and this is just my own opinion, that they need to learn that art of tilt the helmet down. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they get ready to weld, they just need to be able to kick it down like that. Now Larry, can I ask you which one do you prefer to use? Well, at my age, I like the auto dark. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's a lot easier, it's a lot more convenient, and then that way there, when you put it down, you get the torch or the stick rod, whatever you're doing welding with, you get it in the right place, and then you take off from welding from there. Okay. So it's a much, much easier job. I've only had uh, a case of welder's flash one time, it was a very mild case, but uh, the students will know that and it ties it, what time does it start? 2 o'clock in, in the morning. <laughs> After you've been flashed at a class, 2 o'clock in the morning, then your eyes burn and there's nothing you can do for it. But I start at 2 o'clock. According to Larry, it doesn't matter what time zone you're in, 2 o'clock in the morning, that's when arc flash hits. That's when it and hits. what does arc flash feel like? It just feels like hot sand in the eyes. And no matter how, what kind of eye drop you want to use or what you want to put on it, hot towel, cold towel, anything, the eyes still burn. And you just have to live with it until it comes out. And how long does that take usually? Probably several hours sometimes. Sometimes I've had a student where he was around, uh, someone else was, uh, they were tacking a uh, fabrication project together. And he was just holding the part. The other guy was doing the tacking, and whenever the guy would strike the arc, he would just close his eyes and mm -hmm. turn his head. Well, they were doing this for several hours. Well, later on that night, at two in the morning, he said he really, he said he got sick, he started vomiting, he ended up in the hospital, and he was in the hospital for a couple of days. We have three types of welding gloves here. Larry, maybe talk about what these are for. Well, if you're gonna do stick welding, because it's a lot, lot hotter and heavier, then you use this gauntlet glove type. It's, a lot, it's insulated and it protects you from the heat of the metal and of the weld. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, it's a lot safer. Now, if you go to MIG welding, which is wire welding, you can go to a little bit lighter glove because you don't need to, uh, you don't generate that much heat. And then when you go to 
TIG welding, then you have to have it so you can, it's a real delicate type operation and you have to have a very soft glove so as you can manipulate the, the welding rod and the filler rod. Mm -hmm. Now if you get where you pick up some hot stuff with your gloves, then you Which can students see here. always do. You can see here how brittle and hard it gets and then pretty soon it's clamped just like that and you can't pick up nothing with it. Uh -huh. So then you just throw it about $10 away and have to go and get a brand new pair. So these are pretty important then. Very If, if you were to pick up something without a glove on, you'd probably be in a lot of trouble. Yes, you would be uh, hurting for certain. One thing that we haven't addressed that is of the utmost importance is respiratory protection, uh, more specifically fume extraction. We are indoors. We have to have forced ventilation. If you're working outdoors, you have natural ventilation. But in here, in our welding booths, we have to draw those fumes away, fumes and gases in particular that are produced by the welding art. And those are very hazardous to your health. So we uh, stress to the students how important it is to properly adjust the fume extraction arm to get it down to within about approximately a foot of, of where you're welding. So when you're welding, the fumes are sucked up and away and not past your head. The uh, welding booths in the past, they've always had the fume extraction up above your head. Well, as you're welding, those fumes rise in the plume, your head's in the plume, and it goes right past your head before it gets to the fume extraction. That's an improper way of doing it. As you can see, there are a lot of variables when it comes to welding safety. I want to thank you for joining us, and I want to send a special thank you to Mike and Larry and Rock Valley College for letting us come in here today. If you have any questions, please visit our website or send us an email. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.